The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. And so we want to turn our Bibles to Colossians 1 from verse 26. I will speak on the valley of dry bones, the valley of dry bones. But I'll get to the Valley of Dry Bones when I'm finishing my presentation. Uh, but let's start from Colossians 1. I want you to get glued to your scriptures. We will be going into the Bible as I preach. Colossians 1, from verse 26. I read from the NIV. I'll be explaining as we go on. The mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the lost people. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of the mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, so I will take the verse 26 to 27 again. The mystery. Now, when we are talking about the mystery, here, what he's trying to say that that which in the past was not known but has now been known, that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the lost people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Now, the verse 26 and 27 is talking about a mystery that has been revealed. Now, what is this mystery? which has been made known that the Apostle Paul is talking about. And he's saying that the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But what is this mystery? Ephesians chapter 3. I'll start from verse 4. Ephesians chapter 3. We are looking at the mystery that has been made known. Ephesians 3 and from 4. In reading this, now the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus. And then he says that, in reading the letter that I'm writing to you, then you will be able to understand my insights into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations, has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. Now, verse 6, if we can read together, let's go. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Shall we read again? This mystery is that. So, listen. Wherever you hear Paul talking about the mystery, mystery, this is the mystery. So, here he said, this mystery is that. So, this is the mystery that he felt that it was hidden in time past. Even he himself, he was persecuting the church because he didn't know this before. So let's read the mystery again. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members and sharers in the promise. Now, so this is the mystery. Because before this time, if you read chapter 2 of Ephesians 3, let's go to verse 2 of Ephesians 3. Now, it begins like this. 
As for you, he's talking about the Gentiles. You were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. This is about those of us who were Gentiles. Now, he continued to speak. And then when he got to verse 6, he says that, And God raised up us with Christ and seated us in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in the kindness to us in Christ. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiworks, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Therefore, I want you to repeat after me. Therefore, Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separated from Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel, and foreigners to the covenant of the promise. Without hope and without God in this world. Now, the next verse says what? But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now, he's trying to let the Gentiles know, the church in Ephesus to know that formerly you were not considered to be part of God's people. But now, through Christ Jesus, you have been brought near. Paul is saying in chapter 3 that this bringing near through the blood of Jesus is the mystery that he has discovered. That because formerly, those who called themselves circumcision were supposed to be the people of God. And through Abraham, God gave them the seal of circumcision. So God chose Israel out of all the nations. And so Paul believed that God called Israel, but he didn't call the other nations. He didn't call the other nations. But he says now, through Christ Jesus, everyone who believes has become part of the citizenship of God. So he's saying that this is the mystery that has been discovered, which is Christ is now in you, the hope of glory. Christ is now in everyone who believes. And according to Paul, that is God's hope of the manifestation of his glory. Now, let's move on to... Verse 29 of Colossians 1. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energies Christ so powerfully works in me. The Apostle Paul is saying that all those who have believed in Christ have become members of the, of the commonwealth of Israel. They have become children of God because of the presence of Christ in them. And he's saying that God has given him a mystery to such people. And he's going to work with all the energy that God will enable him. He will work with all the energy that God will enable him. This community of believers who have become members of Israel because of the presence of Christ are called the church. I said they are called what? The church. So we used to have Israel as a people of God. But now through God's grace and through the blood, 
And through the gospel, anyone who believes becomes a member of the church. So all of us who have believed have become members of God's household, the church. And now I want you to pay attention from here. The church is God's hope on earth. That is why he's saying that Christ in you is a hope of glory, is a hope of the manifestation of the glory of God. Christ in one person in a family is a hope of glory. It is a hope of the manifestation of the glory of God in that family. So all of us are people that God hopes in. Why? Because of the presence of Christ in you. Christ in you at your workplace is a hope of the manifestation of the glory of God at that place. So Christ in us is a hope of glory. We have not just received Jesus for naught. We have received him so that Christ will hope in us. Why is he hoping in us? This is where I want all of us to follow closely. The church is God's primary partner of the salvation of the earth. The church. That is, every one of us who has Christ in him is God's partner for the salvation of the earth. Every one of us is God's partner. That is why John says that we are all branches of the true vine. So everywhere that you are, it is like you are representing Christ. When we say that this is a branch of the church of Pentecost, what that means is that this assembly is also representing the church of Pentecost. So wherever you are, when you branch to your workplace as a nurse, Christ in you, the hope of glory, so that you partner with him for the salvation of the people around you in that office, you partner with him. What makes one a member of the church is the spirit of Christ which is in them. And that, according to the scripture, is God's hope of glory. So it is safe for us to say that the church is God's hope of the manifestation of his glory on earth. According to Malachi chapter 2, he says that, Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offsprings. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. Now what this scripture is saying in Malachi 2, 15, is this. When two believers come to the altar to be married, the Bible says that heaven rejoices because heaven is expecting that out of the two believers will come godly offsprings. Now, so that all things being equal, we don't expect two believers' kids to be armed robbers. We don't expect them to be on the streets. We don't expect them to go and join the other kingdom and fight against the kingdom of God. So when two people come to the altar, heaven rejoices. Heaven rejoices because he's expecting out of the two believers godly offsprings. Now, so when you bring that godly offspring and you train the person in Christ and Christ also comes to dwell in your children, they become part of the church and they become part of the partners of God. Are we together? Fine. Now, when someone is born again, what does the Bible say about what goes on in heaven? It says heaven does what? Rejoices. Okay, so let me ask you, why is heaven rejoicing over the salvation of one person? Why? From what I've said, why do you think that heaven will rejoice for the salvation of one soul? Yes, mama. The salvation of that particular soul simply means that he is coming to join the army of God. You see, kingdoms are strong because of the people that are in the kingdom. Kingdoms are strong because of the wealth that they survey. So every kingdom needs people. So that when one person turns to Christ, heaven rejoices. 
because he's also going to be a partner of the ministry of Christ on earth. Are we together? Fine. When one sinner repents, heaven rejoices because God hopes in such a fellow to advance the kingdom. Now, when we are talking about advancing the kingdom, this is what the Bible describes as the ministry of reconciliation. So that to advance the kingdom is to help God reconcile men unto himself. When Christ was on earth, the Bible says God was in Christ, reconciling us to himself. Now, Christ is not on earth, but Christ is in you. Um, I want, there's no small boy here. Nobody's face looks like, okay. And so, when Christ was on earth, through his death, the Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling men unto himself. So not knowing that whilst Christ was walking in the, on, on the shores of Galilee, God was in him, bringing people unto himself. Now Christ is gone. But Christ is now in him, this one. And the Bible says that this one is continuing the ministry that Christ was doing whilst on earth. So now when God was in Christ, Christ was reconciling men unto himself. Now, when Christ is in our brother, he also has to reconcile men unto, unto God. This is what we call the ministry of reconciliation. So when you are born again, please sit down, you don't just come and warm benches. You have come. And because of Christ who is in you, God has given you a ministry of reconciliation. A ministry to bring those who do not know him unto himself. And this is the business of the church. This is the business of the church now. It is the church alone that has been entrusted with this ministry of reconciliation. That is reconciling men unto God. And she alone has the message appropriate for that ministry. 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 17. 2 Corinthians 5 from verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. So God reconciled us to Christ unto himself. And then he has now given us that job to do. So all of us who are born again, we don't just come to church. We always have to know that we are in ministry. So what are we doing this morning? I will soon come to that. God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. You don't need to be a pastor before you know that you are in ministry. Now, in the Church of Pentecost, the pastors that we have in Ghana, we are about 1,500 plus. 1,500 plus. Now, the church, church population in Ghana is 3.1 million. Now, divide that into 3.1 million. You will not even get 1%. So if ministry is left with only the clergy, then it means that under 1% is doing the work. But it's not that. The under 1%, including myself, we are supposed to train the rest for the work of the ministry. Because all of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. All of us have the ministry of reconciliation. So please, let's go to verse 19. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us what? He has committed to us what? The message of reconciliation. Now, this is verse 19. So let's take verse 18, and then we'll come to 19. Shall we read together? All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. 
So he has given us what? The ministry of reconciliation. And verse 9, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So we have the ministry of reconciliation, and then we have what? The message of reconciliation. And so the, the ministry is that through you, you go looking for people and, that, and bringing them to Christ. But when you find anyone, you have to tell the person a message. And he says that he didn't just give us the mystery and he left us. He has given us the message of the reconciliation as well. Now, so what is the message of reconciliation? Let's go to verse... 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, let us take the big one. Verse 21. Shall we read together? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the right. Now, what is this statement here? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What is this? This one is the message of reconciliation. Yeah. It says that he has given us the ministry of reconciliation which is crisis in you. So, just as God was in Christ and reconciling men unto himself, Christ is now in you. You must also allow God to use you to reconcile people unto himself. But when you find one, you have to give him a message. And the message is this verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Huh? So if I'm talking to him, I will use us. To be sin for us so that in him that is Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Simple. This is the message of reconciliation. Simple message. That he has paid your penalty. So when you believe in him, you will become righteousness in Christ. If the person says, yes, I believe. Then he confesses Christ as Lord. And then he becomes like us. You have reconciled the fellow unto God. When that person comes, he is also ushered into the ministry of reconciliation. So that through us, the whole world will be born again. Hallelujah. Are we together? Are we together? So what is, what is church? When we gather like this, what is the purpose? The church is the equipping center for the ministry of reconciliation. We have met as a church. What we are doing this morning, I came, I heard that you were singing praises. We had done the opening prayer again. And then we had a very nice worship. And then I'm also preaching. We'll be praying. All these things that we do in church is to equip every one of us to be effective in the ministry of reconciliation. So when you are a good Christian, there is no need to stay at home. You have to be in church because this is the equipping center. Don't stay at home and come once a while. You have to be at the equipping center. It is the breeding grounds for deliverers. I said what? The church is the breeding ground for deliverers. <laughs> How many of us know that Jesus is our deliverer? Yes. But all of us are deliverers. Just as Moses delivered Israel from Egypt, all of us can be Moses in one way or the other. You can be the deliverer for your family, the deliverer for the people of your workplace. So all of us, this is the breeding grounds for deliverers. We all heard of the Machians. We have heard of the John Wesleys. We have heard of the Moseses. We have heard of great men of God. All of them sat in pews 
and chairs like this. And people touched them. They responded to the gospel in a greater measure. And they have become deliverers. So this is the breeding ground for believers. Yet, even though the church has a message, and we are breeding people to go and deliver this message, this message of the church, if it will be received, the church must be credible. Now, did you hear what I said? If this message of the church, which brings reconciliation, will be received, then the church must be credible. So when we meet like this, we are not only telling you the message to go and preach, we are polishing the church so that the church will be glorious. That is why we are talking about the glorious church, a, a glittering church. You see, the aesthetic beauty of the church must be splendid. When people see the church, it must be attractive. Now, the church is all of us together, and the church is you as an individual. So, the church must be beautiful to behold. So that, you see, when you discredit me, you have discredited my message. And this one, it is a principle. What I don't like is when people use my name to say things that I have not said. Um, when I was somewhere, and then somewhere too, I realized that these pastors were using my name to call for meetings. Uh, they would say that uh, the apostle says we will meet, and that the apostle will come. He knows that when he uses my name to tell the presbyters that I am coming for that meeting, and that, and that I will be present, the presbyters will come. And so soon, People saw me and said, Apostle, we waited for you, you didn't come. Waited for me, for what? I said, oh, but our pastor said, oh, this pastor. He's effectively destroying my name. Soon I'll become somebody who promises and not honor. He's discrediting me. If they discredit you, and then they call you to come and preach, then the presbyter will say, this is the man. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, he's going to turn me into a Ghanaian politician who make a lot of promises, but they will never deliver. And so, when you are discredited, your message will not hold any water. And so, the church should be a beautiful church. It must be a glorious church. The unbelievers should behold us and see us as attractive. Then, our message will be readily received. Have I communicated? Fine. Our message will be readily received. As chapter 2 from verse 46. You can, when you go home, you can read from 42, but for the sake of time, I'll take it from 46. Every day, they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They, the church, the believers. They, the believers broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Can you imagine them doing that? Yes. They are together, breaking bread. They ate with sincere hearts. That was the kind of fellowship they had. Praising God and enjoying what? Enjoying what? The favor of how many people? Now, who were those the church enjoyed their favor? The outsiders, they saw the church and they were favorably disposed because the people saw beauty. And the Bible says that, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The very people who yielded their, their fellowship, God brought them together, brought them to come and join them. So brothers and sisters, the church must be beautiful to behold. And it depends on what we are doing on the inside, our fellowship, and how we live out this holy life so that people are attracted to the kingdom of God. Moreover, the church must be alive. You see, we have, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, and then we say we have a message of reconciliation, 
But we are saying that yet the church must be credible. And then secondly, the church must be alive. You see, when you are not alive, you are not able to effectively carry on your mandate. If there's no revival in the church, delivering on our mandate will become difficult. So the church should be revived so that we can go out there and possess the nations. The church must be alive, must be strong and powerful to be able to carry out its mandate effectively because she has an opposition in the devil. When the church is not alive and revived and is not strong, the devil will oppose the church. So when the church is strong, she's able to carry out its mandate. It must be alive. It must be revived for effective expression of the mandate. A dead church, please repeat this after me. A dead church cannot revive dead souls. A dead church cannot revive dead souls. Now, Paul Rees have said this, and I want us to read together. This is, man is called Paul Rees. He has said this. Let's read together. Revival is an experience in the church. Evangelism is an expression of the church. Let's take it again. Revival is an in the church. Evangelism is an expression of the church. Now, so which one comes first? Revival will make evangelism what? Easy. So when there's revival, we go out there and then we express the evangelism. So when there's no revival, you tell the people, hey, this is Gospel Sunday. And then you are talking to 100 people that try and bring one person. And you come to church and somehow you have zero new converts coming to join the kingdom. Because all the hundred people that you spoke to, every one of them is dead. So they just couldn't go out and carry out their mandate of reconciling people unto themselves. You would have expected that if I spoke to hundred people that this coming Sunday, and of course, this coming Sunday is Gospel Sunday. Bring us one person. Look at the many people that are lost here in Tema. And I've told all of you to bring one person. How come that we had zero people responding to the gospel? Because the church is not alive. So we couldn't express our mandate. As for the coming to church, we can come. But there must be life in the church. Are we together? Fine, are we together? So when there is revival, we are able to express our mandate freely and effectively. Revival makes it easier for the church to deliver on its mandate. So we need to arise as a church and put on our strength. Isaiah 52, verse 1 and 2. Isaiah 52, 1 and 2. Awake, awake, Zion. And when we are talking about Zion, we are referring to the church. Clothe yourself with what? Strength. Put on the garment of splendor. Put on what? The garment of splendor. Because the outside people should see you well gladded. They should see your beauty. So you have strength within and splendor without. Can you say that? Strength within and splendor without. So there's so much strength in you. Meanwhile, you are well gladded in your costume or your attire. So you are attractive. You are strong. And then if you have the message, then there will be deliverance. There will be deliverance. Put on your garment of splendor, Jerusalem, the holy city. Now the church, the holy people of God. The uncircumcised, that is the unbeliever, and the defiled will not enter into you again. Shake off your dust. Rise up, sit and throne, Jerusalem. Free yourself from the chains of your neck. Daughter of Zion, now a captive. If you're a daughter of Zion, you cannot be a captive. So free yourself from every chain. And let us go out there and be strong. And put on our splendor. 
and then reconcile men unto himself. After all, we also have the message of reconciliation. So when we are strong, we'll be able to carry off out our mandate very well. So awake, ye you sleeper, and put on your strength, and Christ will rise upon you in the name of Jesus. Now verse 7 of Isaiah 52 says this. Verse 7 of Isaiah 52. We have just studied that when there's a revival, then we can go out there and express evangelism. Let's read together. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Now, but if you can't preach good news when you don't put on your strength, your good news will not be accepted when you are not splendidly clothed. You have to put on your garment of splendor. Now, when we do this and we put on our strength, no weapon fashioned against us will prosper. Nothing will be able to stand against us. For greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. Greater is he. And once we put on our strength and we are well gladded in our holiness, the zeal of the Lord of hosts in us will accomplish this. And many will come to the saving knowledge because of you and because of me. Hallelujah. Nothing will be impossible to accomplish. Ezekiel 31. From verse 7. So I'm imagining that we have put on our strength and then we are out there at your workplace in the midst of the corruption. Nothing should be impossible. Nobody should think that the Church of Pentecost cannot lead the churches in bringing Ghana out of corruption. Nobody should think this is impossible. <laughs> Nobody should think it is impossible. You see, when the presiding elder was talking about the prison and all that, I was laughing. You see, those who were saying negative things, they help spread the message. Yeah. So we thank God for their lives. After, <laughs> they help spread the message. After all, we didn't build for them. We built for the prisoners, and then it's okay. And they are our clients. Now, once that burden is there, anyone who comes to prison, you come and meet us there. Yeah. You come and meet us there till kingdom come. Yeah. And then you come and meet. You see, we have Pentecost prison chaplains. Pastors are also there. You come and meet us. Yeah. <laughs> you come and meet us. When they put you there, then you, before you, you lift up your head, I'm there. Yeah. We pray and we go out here here for, and by God's grace, He has given us some of these people somewhere. And we go and build for them. Give them good place to sleep. And then by the time they wake up, Christ is standing by their best side. <laughs> Christ is standing by their best side. It's only that, you see, this is the wisdom. And it has shocked the devil. Yeah. It has shocked the whole world. They never thought that somebody would think about prisoners. Yeah. It has shocked them. They said we should have built schools. If we have built a school, would that, would that have been a news? If you build hospitals, the Romans have bigger ones than this. It will not have been a news. The devil is crying. And I'm telling you, these prisons, individuals who are not members of the church are building it. Yeah. They are building it. One person who is not a member, he is building two. Yeah. And, and that is the mystery. People who are not members, they are building it and they will build it for us and then we will present it. That is what God is doing. So, in the valley of the dry bones, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of what? Bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley. Bones that were very dry. They were breached. He asked me, son of man, 
can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. <laughs> I like Ezekiel. Some idiot meaning. If these bones can live, you are the Sovereign Lord. You alone know. That was very good. You see, Isaiah has given us a picture of Israel that is covered with sores. And now somehow, this Israel is dead. And now it, they, they are disintegrated. They are, they are not just skeleton. They have been dismembered. Bones have been dismembered. And it has become bleach. Very dry bones in a valley. And this is a revelation. It's not, it's not a physical thing. He saw a revelation. And then he says that, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, you are the sovereign Lord. You alone know. See, Ezekiel was then asked to prophesy unto the dry bones that here you dry bones live. You see, he was confronted with death. Could he bring life out of this dead and dry bones? He was confronted with curse. Did he have any cure for these dry bones? As a man, he must have shuddered at the sight of the valley of dry bones. But pivoted on Ezekiel's faith are the destinies of thousands, if not millions of people. All these dry bones, whether they will live, will depend on Ezekiel's faith. Now, God is, God is saying a prophesy. But you need faith to take the word of God. And look at these bleached bones and then prophesy. It is not about prayer. He was a man of prayer, but he was also a man of faith. Now let's listen to Ezekiel. There, on the dry bones, this is what Ezekiel said. Hear the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. I prophesy unto you. Now, have you seen dry bones with ears before? But he's saying that here, you dry bones, thou sayest the Lord, I prophesy unto you. And as he prophesied, this is what the Bible says, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Now, Ezekiel prophesied, and the bone came together, and then flesh covered them, but there was no life in them. So these are corpses. What is the use of corpses? And God said, Ezekiel, I, I think that by now you are encouraged. Prophesy that life should come into them. Then Ezekiel said, this is the word of God to you. Life, come into these beings. And the Bible said, life came into them. And they stood as a mighty army. Hallelujah. They stood as a mighty army. My brothers, you see, we serve an omnipotent God. When we connect our impotence to his omnipotence, impossibility is dissolved. Yeah. We, we, we don't have strength like Ezekiel, but God is the almighty God. And then when we connect our impotence, our inability... To his omnipotence, then I said impossibilities are placed behind us. Can we change the attitude of Ghanaians, this indisciplined attitude of Ghanaians? Yes, we can. Can the church succeed in curbing corruption in the land? Yes, we can. Can we possess every sphere of society with the values and principles of the kingdom of God? Yes, we can. We can do that. We can do that. Can we change the media landscape? Yes, we can do that. What about the political landscape? We can do that. Can we influence the nation in part of righteousness? Yes, we can do that. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. If you are willing and obedient, we shall take this nation. Unless we are not willing, 
It doesn't matter how dry the bones are. It doesn't matter how corrupt the system seems to be. You are God's agent of transformation. Possessing the nations, I am an agent of transformation. Only that you do not know that you have the ministry of reconciliation. Only that you are not conscious that you have the message of reconciliation. Rise and begin to prophesy that life should come to this office. Life should come to this nation. Righteousness upon the land. And many who come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Maybe you are seated there, you are asking, can my marriage be turned around? Yes, it can. Can I secure a job? Yes, you can have a job. Will I be able to complete school? Yes, you complete school. God will be your provider and the zeal of the Lord will accomplish it. All God is waiting for is someone who will trust him as the sovereign Lord. Will trust him, will trust in his living word and apply it as he hears God speak and situations will change. John Wesley did it and we can do it in our day. How many of us are willing to profess unto the dryness of the bones? Shall we rise to our feet? Let us begin to pray in tongues. I want you to begin to pray in tongues until you see that the river of life is flowing through you. Shall we pray in the name of Jesus? Lord, I believe all things are possible. If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come now and Ghana shall be saved. If you know how to sing this song, you can come and join us. If you believe and I believe. If you don't know the English, then you know the key version. So, ujidi na me jidia na ye bom bom Sum sum krong krong sum sum krong krong Besa naba Gana benya ashobo Gana benya ashobo Gana benya ashobo and begin to cry unto the Lord. I want you to pray in tongues if you can. Let us begin to prophesy unto every dry bone that life should come upon the dry bone.